All right. Um, good morning, everyone. It's really great honor and pleasure to be here. Um, I, I'm, first of all, really appreciate the organizers for such a, a wonderful opportunity for organizing this symposium. And frankly speaking, I think I attend the first one since quite a long time ago. So good to see good old friends and also new friends right here. Um, after the morning, a uh, wonderful talk, uh, particularly after James' wonderful, concise and precise talk, I started to get very, very uh, afraid of my talk because I find my talk has a lot of technical details. And if we really look at the venue, very particular venue that we have today, I think we should not just having, us, having our cell to be kind of um, buried by those technical details. We should be having something that's uh, more, more, relatively having more wisdom more philosophical type of thinking on the tiny important topic over here today. So I just want to beg your pardon, uh, beg your pardon first, is uh, don't pay too much attention on the technical content because I prepare a lot for that. Let's think about something in terms of bigger picture. Let's think about what the lesson that we learn from all the technical study. And that's what I start with my talk about the sludge management from the wastewater issues. All right. So I'm in the University of Hong Kong, and I have a research group called Environmental Materials uh, that was PhD student, postdoc, all together. And so again, uh, it's all their research outcome instead of my own. And uh, what I would like to, yeah, sorry. What I would like to say is that in terms of my group, we work on a couple of things, including uh, the pollution prevention, also the combination, uh, also the uh, um, get rid of the pollutants out of the environment. That's basically what we do. With that, we actually generate all different kinds of materials coming out from the waste streams. And one of them is from the wastewater stream, for example, sludge. And I had a, a, a really great honor to be in the University of Hong Kong, which is the, uh, the first university in Hong Kong. And um, you know, it was uh, more than 100 years. And I think one of the most famous person, uh, alumni, uh, a lot of people know is Dr. Sun Yat-sen, who has actually said that uh, Hong Kong and the University of Hong Kong it was his first place of the knowledge. That was his uh, talk in the years of 2020, uh, no, sorry, the year of 1923 over there. And I think uh, lucky today we're still trying to carry that kind of mission for all the people all over the world not only in this region, and proudly to be one of the university that continue working toward this score with all the students and colleagues supports. Okay, so we all understand water, water important. Okay, one of the great challenges being said by US National Academy of Engineering, but a lot of people actually do not know when we have the wastewater treatment plan, as you can see from, a lot of people just basically thinking about we have wastewater going in and we have clean water coming out, like a magic box. But there is no magic box. Everything is based on science. So when we have a lot of pollutant going into the wastewater treatment plant, and we have clean water coming out, there must be certain waste generator. So sludge will be the main part coming out from that. And actually, the better of the, white, the wastewater you want to manage, you want to treat, you actually generate more sludge. So pretty this way, if I'm basically you know, staying in environmental engineering field long enough, I can say a lot of environment engineers' idea was only caring about themselves. Water people only treat water. They don't care about anything else. They generate sludge and they don't care. And the solid waste management person take the sludge and they try to burn it and they generate the pollutant to the air and they, they don't care. That is not a responsible industry. That is not a responsible and wise enough thinking in terms of our environmental philosophy. We should be more just like the center's name, sustainable, in terms of thinking about the overall pictures. So what we're trying to do is, okay, look at what Hong Kong is actually experiencing. We probably have about 10, uh, about a thousand tons of sludge today, and we're being expecting two and a half times of sludge being increased. Everybody in the, Environment engineering now says sludge generation is proportional to the wastewater. And wastewater quantity is proportional to the population. We don't have two and a half times the population increase. How come we have the sludge being more generated? That's the same idea I'm talking about because water people only care about water. They don't care about any consequence 
out of the water treatment process, and that is wrong. So let's look at the sludge. In fact, we have all different kinds of sludge during the process. I don't want to go too much detail, but I just want to say we have nutrients. And that's exactly what the agriculture needs. We have to have it, but we have to have it right. So first of all, uh, uh, nitrogen, phosphate, and potassium, those are actually already in the sludge. And look at a theme, that which one of the reasons that I always like to come back to this conference is that we are being ask to be more inspired and look at this nature system, how to incorporate with the agriculture activity with our very rich and valuable organic resources. So um, we can have that for agriculture applications. That's a very good thought and it's low cost, simple, and that has been very, very commonly used for so-called land application in the official term in the United States, for example. So a lot of this, what we call the bio-solid, biomass sludge coming out from wastewater treatment process can be land applied. And you do have some incineration, the rest of that, you know, go to landfill without being used, which is the worst. But recent science tells us some more new lesson, which is today our sludge, because our wastewater Compositions are quite different, so our sludge composition will be also quite different. You may have a lot of new chemicals going to the wastewater, therefore you end up in a sludge. So is the land application still going to be a viable process? We have to ask this question. And then we have to ask if we have to do something, what our technology can help us? Okay, so let's look at the US land application process. Um, the organic uh, content contaminant front, and people are being saying that the a uh, lot of uh, organic contaminants have been identified, particularly for those more hydrophobics, and the processing of the basically use the raw sewage or raw sludge for land application has been of certain questions. Therefore, in order to protect the environment and also be more sustainable for the entire system, if not also with the human health, then at this moment, sorry, at this moment, just a quick box right here. Here's a key thing. The sewage needs to be treated before you do, you, you use that for land application. So you can still use for land application, but the sewage cannot be raw or the sludge cannot be raw. You have to treat that. And that's how I say that, how the technology comes. So this is kind of a, a quick overview, a lot of technical issue, but I don't want to spend too much time right there. Look at what all the research trend these days in the world, how to basically treat the sludge for, for example, beneficial uses like for land application. Uh, we do some literature re uh, re reviews and then look at, you can find mostly a lot of people talk about anaerobic digestions, use the bacteria to turn it into methane, and then you have some of the leftover residues as part of the land application process. You do can see a group of people looking at incineration, all right? Incineration, let's not forget, it does also generate ash, and the ash can also be a beneficial use for agriculture activity, if you like. Pyrosis is another process, gasifications, and also some of the new process like wet air oxidation or so-called supercritical water um, uh, oxidation process. Let's quickly look at it one by one. First of all, aerobic, anaerobic pro, uh, digestions. That part, you can always see the kind of egg-shaped type of reactor. You put the waste in there, you go through uh, hydrolysis, you know, and to get all the way to mesogenesis, generate methane, and you have energy recovery, and you still have some residues, and the residues, you know, you can go for agriculture process if you like. In that way, a lot of, uh, you can say, harmful organics could be already being decomposed. So in terms of the concern of organic contaminant will be relatively less. Okay, so with that, we understand the, the good thing for AD is that um, it, it actually generate energy, number one, and the, uh, uh, the sludge will be stabilized together with uh, the order compared to composting. Well, I like composting, no problem, because it's very simple to be operated, but for some city area or urban environment, sometimes the order could be a concern. But in that case, AD could be your another choice if you like. Of course, the limitation is for still with the setting of the location and also the uh, together with the 
residue that really need to think about how to be safely applied. For example, for land application, before you have those material well certified. Okay, incineration, a lot of people know this, just burn it, but in fact, it has a lot of uh, constraints because uh, the, the, uh, the currently, I think air pollution issues will be a problem. Um, the cost for high capital costs has been always there. But of course, the advantage, particularly for urban environment, is a large, large volume reductions, particularly uh, if certain area, they need to have the sludge to be, you know, a landfill, and then they have to care the mixture with some municipal solid waste together with the sludge. Because you cannot, you cannot always, you cannot just put the sludge in the landfill. The landfill, uh, stay, the slow sterilization will be a problem. So that would be an option. But I always want to say that even you have incineration, you still, if you look at the nutrient that we're talking about, we still have phosphate. You still have potassium. And that part shouldn't be wasted. Okay. Where air oscillations basically use, uh, you know, relatively uh, hu uh, high humidities of the air together with some temperature. And then you have about 30 minutes. That will actually help to degrade a lot of organic pollutants and make it safe for land application, for example. So I think that's one of the options that we can, and as actually a very increasing trend of doing a lot of study, look at the composition after you have the uh, WAO. If you have um, the way air, again, uh, you have quite clean of gas and the benefits, uh, including um, the COD, which means the carbon, some carbon will be reduced and your material will be relatively more stable, uh, less leached. The operations, of course, uh, will have the corrosion protect, uh, protection issue because we're talking about high humidity operations. How can the humidity with the continuing operations will be robust in terms of the functionality of the system is very important. And uh, I want to say another method, which is, I would say, more enhanced version of wet air oxidation is what we call supercritical water oxidations. In this case, you can see that you're using relatively higher temperature in the process. And with the higher temperature, one thing we can expect is that your degradation of the harmful organic pollutants could be potentially uh, be of further benefit, which means that it will be probably safer for the product to be used. Of course, uh, you do have a lot of process uh, that need to relatively uh, new process that's not standardized in the industry that needs to be designed to be tested uh, throughout your pilot scale all the way to the uh, large scale. Okay. Lastly, we start to look at two systems together. That is what we call the pyrolysis and also the, uh, what we call the gasification. In fact, these two are very similar. It's basically well, once you have a sludge, right, and then you heat it up, um, if you get 100% air, that's incineration. If you get 0% air, then that's pyrolysis. Pyrolysis will generate the very famous, I didn't put it right here, but a lot of people must already know it, which one we call bio. Char. <laughs> so biochar process come from the pyrolysis. And then if you have a way to use biochar, go ahead. This is the, actually the quite mature process that are uh, being used to petroleum chemical process to have the organic, com uh, to have organic substance to be pyrolyzed. But it doesn't have this problem because you have some of the tar and also a lot of, pro a lot of materials. Uh, you are not having that much of the solid waste reductions. You have to understand you have a good channel for the real biochar. If you don't, then actually pyrolysis is not really helping to reduce the amount of sludge problem too much. So some people have a mitigate process called gasification. Gasification, again, 0% pyrolysis, 0% air pyrolysis, 100% air incineration, somewhere in between. <laughs> That's gasification, whatever you like. So you actually have some of gas, which means that you still generate some gas phase that like the methane, hydrogen, that you can use for energy. But at the same time, your residue will be relatively much less compared to pyrosis. So you can see the new technology these days give us a range of choice for us to do to generate number one recovery energy and generate different type of substance throughout this process. And then looking for the next step of the applications. All right, so gasification now, uh, what we are observing has been a quite really, really fast development. But the problem 
<laughs> not free lunch in the world. <laughs> the problem is that so far I see a huge pro a huge challenge that not able to scale it up. It's all still relatively small scale. If you're looking for um, full scale, uh, functionally perfectly functioning, um, the type of example in a commercial basis, I haven't seen it. <laughs> there are some of the pilot scale kind are doing very well. Okay, great. I, I love to see for development over there. I hope I'm wrong today uh, because maybe tomorrow there are some good news coming out, but that's our observation at this moment. It's my duty to report this to you, but this could be one of the way a lot of people intensively investigating the effort and resources to work on. Okay, so look at the, uh, those options and then big cities like Hong Kong, <laughs> what we do? Well, we used to basically landfill it. Well. Um, because you probably know that Hong Kong hit the past history was basically following British history. And British, British like, like landfill, <laughs> do a lot of landfilling and try to capture the, uh, um, the, the gas coming out of that. But we start to change that. We start to change to its large incinerations. Well, the reason which I didn't plan to spend too much time to talk about here, but it's very interesting is that in Hong Kong, because we have a relatively small piece of land, so our landfill is actually very close to the residential area. Right. When we, let, when we landfill the sludge, because the sludge is like a mud, it's like very muddy, particularly when you have raining days and it starts to be like a mud flow, you know? And therefore, there's an important rule in Hong Kong is that when we landfill one part of a sludge, it needs, to go, it needs to go with 10 parts of municipal solid waste. So one to 10. Otherwise, they're kind of very fruity. Uh, the, the kind of, uh, kind of uh, uh, mud-like sludge will have problems and then causing the, the safety actually um, in the nearby areas of the landfill. But we have been promoting the reduction of municipal solid waste a lot. But at the same time, we're, we're creating two and a half times of sludge. So this 10-1 ratio couldn't maintain anymore. So we have to quickly find another solution, and that's what's the incineration. Of course, they have been uh, uh, using the state of the art uh, incineration process, which is fruit ice bad incinerator for sludge, the most suitable uh, type of incinerator for sludge, no doubts. Um, and then it was pretty much uh, uh, contract by international company like Veolia from French, Arabs from, from, from UK, or Alehan mostly from, uh, based in Australia. So uh, they, they do it very well. Um, they even have, so this is our sludge incinerator. As you can see, it's like a tourist site. In fact, in Hong Kong, it has been marketed as a tourist site because you can have an a, a educational center. You even have a jacuzzi, you know, over there for free. Whoever wants to go, go ahead. And, you know, so they have this kind of uh, relationship with the, with the nearby area of tourists to try to get people to support. So that's our solution. But as what I'm saying, you probably see that that should be not ending there because the ash actually still not being beneficially used. The nutrients still being wasted right there. So in my group, we have been uh, thinking about a lot of different ways that probably you can use this residue for construction material or even for uh, the nutrient, which I will introduce slightly later. So that part really come back to the material research. And if you have a good material research, then you can develop good products, safe, and also a uh, lot of cost enough. One of the actually the method that we've been working on is the construction material, which means for ceramic material, for example. A lot of people consider ceramic material is very easy. You just put a clay, like calden clay, put it together, burn it to high temperature. But it's just not that easy because there are a lot of chemistry over there. Um, I don't want to go too much uh, in, the in the detail, but I'm just trying to say, in terms of the clay burning, you find a lot of positive and negative uh, opinion. Some people say it's very effective, some people say it's not, and we find out it's because a lot of people actually do a lot of mechanism. One of the mechanisms that we find out is the spinel moli reaction series, very important, that you can have the mirror phase to host your heavy metal, whether it being host nicely or not, make huge differences. So we use the x-ray diffraction techniques, and then we find out different, well, as you say, we find out, it's, it's the nature of the system that most can most, most environmental chemists only look at the chemical formula, which is not enough. You should look at mirrorologies. For example, aluminum oxide, same AL203, actually is a different kind of crystal structure. You cannot differentiate by chemical analysis because it's only aluminum and oxy aluminum oxygens. But 
the neurologies help you to tell different type of alpha lumina, gamma lumina, for example. So this is a typical X-ray diffraction that you can put a material in there, it will give you a pattern, and you just use the uh, standard pattern A and B to fit it. Everybody can do it pretty much in the, in the area. But if I ask how much percent A and B, 99% <laughs> people do not do that because they don't know this quantitative and they, they don't know this conventional qualitative analysis of X-ray can be qualitative. And it needs to be qualitative because our natural system is actually a very mixed world. Right? We should not only know who they are, but we should also know how many of them. Because in the industry, if you put things in the industry, you cannot just say, hey, I have a five members right there, but how? No. 90% purity and 10% purity is a completely different value in the industry. Sometimes probably even, in, even used for the, even the case for the fertilizer, for example. So we try to use uh, atomic structure simulation to analyze our X-ray uh, X-ray diffraction patterns, and I use the X-ray diffraction, use the diffraction, diffraction to quantify each phase is coming out. So that's been one of the strong uh, power that we have in terms of the techniques. So we start to look at all the heavy metal, how they actually incorporate into different kind of metrics in the geo material, and we try to see, for example, this is a nickel leaching capability being hosted by different type of mirror phase, and we find out some of them are not better, some of them not so good. And, but the good thing is that, yes, if you have a good um, um, mirror face there to stabilize your heavy metal, then even your heavy metal is being incorporated in your residues. It actually doesn't release into the nature system. It doesn't actually release into your fertilizer. Well, it's there, but it's not being soluble, being absorbed by the crane. Nothing wrong with that. So that is an important skill that we'd like to look into that. I won't go too much about the chemistry, but I'm trying to say we look at nickel, we look at copper, we look at all different kind of metals. And one of the good things that we have in the lab, it's particularly quite unique in the world, is that we have to use a fundamental parameter approach that make the spectrons analysis more meaningful. Because at this moment, a lot of the lab, they have a lot of uh, their sample result, basically mixed with the sample information together with the instruments. So you have to really have that, what we call a fundamental parameter approach to get rid of that instrument effect and generate a new phases coming out and do the more physically meaningful analysis on that. We also have to use the internal uh, standard to really find out the amorphous content because XRD is not able to see amorphous content. You have to have the internal standard. Otherwise, a lot of research without internal standards, actually, I think the data is not reliable. So we did the copper, we did the uh, uh, copper aluminum system, uh, copper, uh, cal the, the clay system. We always find out there's a very, very good window that you can operate your process nicely in order to have a good result coming out. We start to look at for all this kind of, uh, all this kind of uh, uh, real waste, combine that, see whether it really come out as what we, what, we, what we have in the lab, and it match actually nicely. This is the case for zinc, for example. So again, sometimes you process that not enough, it's not enough. <laughs> you process it too much, you actually have different kinds of uh, adverse effect like this one. You know, it processed high temperature, the result wasn't that good. It all solved me mechanistically by the scientific research. So we started to look at leaching behavior, we look at how the metal actually leaves this mirror face. If you leave the mirror face in the water face, then that will be absorbed by the plane. If it's not, then it's fine. The plane will actually not absorb any of them. So that's what, and then we find out the, the process on the surface, what are the chemical phases on the surface to judge whether the material is safe or not. So I'm just trying to say that uh, let's not just look at the effect to judge whether the material is safe or not. We look at a scientific basis, look at the real mirror face, chemical compositions is one of, just one of the informations. So again, uh, we look at the surface, somehow whether the surface heavy metal will come out because we understand if you have a piece of material, if the heavy metal is inside the material, it, it doesn't matter. It will not affect you because it's not a surface. Only surface harmful material will come out and dissolve. So, and particularly a lot of heavy metal, you cannot make heavy metal disappear because it's part of the nature. So the most important thing is to control the behavior. Just bear with me a little bit, few seconds. I know you're gonna give me time to up, but. <laughs> Last, last content <laughs> is that in, instead of just stabilize, instead of just stabilize the metal, we want to recover resources. And one of the very good thing is phosphate. 
Phosphates is a very interesting question that we need phosphate because it's a very important part for the fertilizer. But at the same time, phosphate is one of the biggest environmental pollutants that make us eutrophications. So we need that, but we also in trouble by too much of that. Now, how ironic that shows our poor management of these resources in the world. So, hey, can we actually recover the phosphate from the wastewater? The answer is yes. How do we do that? We can use X-ray diffraction to quantitatively knowing how much of that. One of the most important phases is what we call struvite. That has been considered a slow releasing phosphates. It has ammonia, so it can supply nitrogen at the same time, also the phosphates. But the purity of a lot of this recover uh, recovered struvite are not well controlled. And it's not used for agricultural activity. And then sometimes they find good results, sometimes they find not. That's the problem. So we just try to say that we use this all different kind of, I think we're at one in the, the first one in the world to really standardize this process to really uh, use X-ray diffraction. Actually, the chemical method cannot solve this. You have to use crystallization phase uh, process. And we have our standard, and then we use the method, we find out the standard, the, the, I mean, the answer, and what we actually measure is match perfectly. So we often get sample from different places in the world, from wastewater, and they say we have recover the struvai uh, in the in recover phosphate in struvai form is 100% pure struvai. And we often kind of <laughs> find out they are not. <laughs> like this one is from one of the wastewater treatment places uh, in, in Italy, a city. You find out actually it's only 50%. <laughs> so sometimes it really help you, you know, to control during the operation process, how can you recover the struvai nicely. So overall, I think um, we've been always in this field looking at the chemical and engineering environmental process and one of the editors of these journals and, and we encourage people to look things scientifically, contributing to our environment, contributing to our resource recoveries. And I personally also have uh, two, uh, two books um, on X-ray diffraction, also uh, environmental material. Anyone feel interested on any of this relevant topic, feel free to see how much I can help you. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Professor, for your nice talk. Uh, I think we're near the lunch time, so I want to close this section. If you have any question, uh, maybe you will go to the uh, afternoon's comprehensive discussion sections. Okay, thank you, Professor, for your thank nice you, talk. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you very much. Happy lunch time.